Assalamu alaikum. Marhaba bikum. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and passionate advocates for a sustainable future, welcome to African Tapestry, Climate, Crops, and Culture, a Moroccan Perspective. A joint event between SOAS and the Embassy of the Kingdom of Morocco to the United Kingdom. Today, we embark on a profound exploration of the intricate interplay between climate, agriculture, and cultural identity through the lens of Morocco's rich heritage and forward-thinking perspectives. My name is Brooke Beardsley, and as a SOAS alumni, a SOAS global ambassador, and a resident of both Morocco and the United Kingdom, it is a, the greatest honor to be your MC tonight. In an era marked by unprecedented challenges and opportunities, the significance of the global South, and particularly Africa, has never been more pronounced. Amidst the complexities of our global landscape, Africa stands as a beacon of resilience, innovation, and hope. Morocco, with its deep-rooted history, vibrant culture, and commi commitment to South-South cooperation, exemplifies the potential for collective progress and unity in addressing the critical issues of our time. As we delve into the themes of climate action, sustainable agriculture, and cultural harmony, let us draw inspiration from Morocco's journey and envision new pathways for empowerment, cooperation, and peace. Before we proceed, a few logistical notes to ensure our day is as enriching and smooth as possible. We encourage active participation tonight, so please feel free to engage with our speakers through uh, the Q&A session. Breaks and network, networking sessions have been scheduled to allow for deeper conversations and connections. We invite you to take full advantage of these opportunities to meet the speakers and ask them any questions you like. Now it is my complete honor to introduce our esteemed opening speaker, Professor Adam Habib, Director of SOAS, a distinguished scholar, a fervent advocate for social justice, Professor Habib's insights will undoubtedly set a compelling stage for today's discussions. So please join me in welcoming Professor Habib. So thank you, Brooke. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Akim Ajoui, Ambassador of His Majesty, the King of Morocco to the United Kingdom, Dr. Ahmed Abadi, uh, of course, our president, Zainab Badawi. I love the ring of President uh, Badawi. And then my colleague, friend, brother, Mengis Tabayele. And there are many, many other colleagues in the room. So let me welcome all of you uh, to SOAS. You know, we've um, really excited to host this event with the Embassy of Morocco. And there are a couple of reasons why. As Brooke suggested, we're bringing together the fundamental challenges of our time, climate, food, security, and agriculture, and culture. And the reason we do this is because it seems to me that we live in a moment where all of our significant challenges are transnational in character. These challenges don't have only local manifestations, they have transnational manifestations. Climate change doesn't require a single country to resolve it. It requires the entire world, the entire continents of our world to find a collective solution to the challenge. The same goes for food. We're living in the 21st century and our single challenge of our time is how do we in the midst of such wealth in the midst of such wealth how is it that we have people starving that we have children starving in this world it is a truly unacceptable situation and that's not simply happening 
in the poorer parts of the world. People are starving in very rich parts of the world as well. So the big question is, how do we create, uh, we begin to address these two challenges. Of course, the question of cultural identity is as important to our world today. There are some manifestations of cultural identity that lead to people killing each other. And yet, there are other manifestations of cultural identity that enable people to come together in powerful ways. Last night, I was having a dinner with the colleagues and we spoke about how is it that in some parts of our world, in Jerusalem, for instance, there were centuries when people of different religious communities lived in peace with each other. And yet, we now are confronted in a moment when people are killing each other. And 11,500 children, 12,000 ch children have died in the dawn of the 21st century. What has happened to our uh, context, our world? And so one of the things that SOAS is trying to do is to serve as a bridge, a bridge, a university that trains students and professionals. It wants to do research, but what it wants to also do through its teaching and research is serve as a bridge between different parts of the world, between the UK and Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, but through the UK, between the West and uh, what I call the majoritarian parts of our world, because that's where the majority of the world's population live. And we need to understand if we're going to find solutions to the challenges of our time, then we need the ability to start thinking through both local solutions and global technologies. You can have global science, you can have global technologies, but you need local knowledge to enable those local global science and, te and technologies to work. Think about this. Just two, three years ago, we had COVID. We had a vaccine, but that vaccine played out even, it was firstly unevenly distributed. So in the continent that I come from, Africa, it didn't, wasn't adequately deployed because the way it was bought up and hoarded in other parts of the world, prevented that. But secondly, even when it was deployed, its effects were fundamentally different in Tokyo to New York, in Seoul to London. And that's because local knowledge matters. The local architecture, the local culture, the local political institutions, how power is constructed in a local context. And so if we're going to address the challenges of our time, we need global science, global technologies, and local knowledge to intersect with each other. As much as we do that, we need, everybody talks about science being a global project. But science can be only global if it takes the concerns, the issues, the challenges of the people of our majoritarian world. We take knowledge, we apply it to our local context, and in the process, we innovate it and hand it back to the world. That's what we mean by global science. And so when we have this event, African tapestry, climate crops and culture, we not only address the three challenges of our time, but in a partnership between SARS and the embassy, we symbolize a partnership between an institution in the UK and an institution on the African continent an institution that is located in one continent, reaching out across the sea to an institution in another continent to say that can we collectively think through the challenges of our time? Can we collectively teach the, the people of our world? Can we look and do the research from the perspectives of the innovations 
on both sides of the of the Mediterranean, and in the process, begin to think through how we find solutions, collective solutions, to the challenges of our time. See, in the end, ultimately, if we don't fix climate change, if we don't fix food security, and if we don't fix the deep, deep cultural fissures that have emerged in our world today, we won't survive as a human species. We are on the last track of humanity's existence. And if we want to survive as a collective humanity, we better learn to live with each other. But we can only learn to live with each other if justice becomes a part of defining who we are and how we live with each other. And so this event is really about celebrating all of that. Yes, we'll speak about climate and there'll be a conversation uh, in a minute around that. Uh, we'll speak about crops and we will speak about culture. But ultimately, all of this is meant to symbolize a partnership, a relationship amongst people, amongst institutions, amongst higher education and government, amongst higher education and civil society, between government and civil society, between different peoples of our world, on how to reimagine the challenges of our time, how to recraft solutions for the challenges of our time, and ultimately how to begin to make this a better world. And that ultimately is the mandate of SARS. We're in university to train people, we're in university to do research, but most importantly, we want to be and serve to be one of multiple bridges, intellectual bridges for the human community. And that's why you, you're here with us today. And that's why we're so excited to have this, this relationship. And so I'm going to, with those few words, because I tend to go on and on and on. And I'm watching my colleagues say, it's time to get off the this stage. So I do want to say very quickly, uh, we are going into the first panel, led by Dr. Wayne Dooling, who's the chair of our Center for African Studies here at uh, SOAS. And the first panel uh, discussion is going to be on harvesting solutions. What role can Africa play in climate action and in the agri-food systems transformation for a sustainable world? Uh, Dr. Wayne Dooling. Thank you very much, Adam. And um, I'll just add um, a welcome to, to Adam's very inspiring words and welcome to all of you here. Um, welcome to SOAS today. Uh, we are very honored to have been asked by the Embassy of Morocco to co-host this event. An enormous amount of work has gone into making today possible on both sides of this uh, new partnership, our side and the side of colleagues at the Moroccan Embassy. Um, and uh, I am absolutely sure that today will be a great success and we hope that it's um, the start of a of an enduring partnership. I won't um, have any further words to say. I'm here to welcome our very esteemed uh, speakers, our panelists today. Uh, we have one panelist who is not here, who is, but will join us on Zoom from Kenya, uh, who couldn't couldn't come to travel because of visa issues. Um, but I will start uh, straight away. I've asked each of our panelists to speak for 10 minutes. The idea is very much to give uh, yourselves, people in the audience, uh, time to engage in the discussion. We certainly don't We certainly don't want it to be a kind of one-way uh, uh, sort of dialogue, but, but to have a, an interactive panel today, both panels, uh, we hope. So without any further ado, I'll introduce our very first speaker, who is Dr. Zucchini Dada, who is the UN expert on climate change, food security, and sustainability. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, first of all, let me express my gratitude and appreciation for uh, His Excellency Ambassador Hakim Hajwi and for Professor Habib for convening us and for organizing this event. So it's really great pleasure to be here and share with you some thought on the global challenges that are facing us and what are the solutions that we really need to deploy to come out of these challenges. And as you know, the world has been going through a succession of crises. 
climate change, biodiversity loss, COVID-19, and also the wars in Ukraine and in Palestine. And all of these, they affect global food security. So um, in 2015, all leaders from around the world, they got together and they thought about what is the future that we want for humanity? And they agreed the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that, that cover all aspects of our life in terms of economy, environment, but also social aspects. And at the same year, the leaders also agreed on the Paris Agreement to tackle climate change, to keep the global temperature below 1.5 degrees C. That's the goal. Why? Because if we stay below 1.5 degrees C, we avoid the danger of climate change. Unfortunately, today, we're not achieving any of these goals. We're going actually backwards. The Sustainable Development Goals, we're only on track to achieve 15% of the target, and we are far away from achieving the 1.5 degrees C climate goal because all efforts from all around the world, they're not enough, unfortunately. And I don't know if you've been following the news in terms of climate change. We've just seen floods in California, state of emergency declared, and also forest fires in Chile, where two days mourning have been declared. And what the scientists from all around the world are telling us, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is that these events are going to continue and those are going to become more frequent and more severe. So we do have the solutions. We are just not deploying them fast enough at the, the scale required to meet the two goals, 1.5 and the SDGs. In terms of food security, Hunger is also on the rise, unfortunately. At the moment, we have around 730 million people who go hungry every day. So climate change and food security, are, they're so interlinked. They do affect each other. Agriculture is the sector most affected by climate change. And it is a sector that is very hungry in terms of the use of natural resources. Agriculture uses around 70% of withdrawn water, 30% of global energy use. And then the whole system, the agri-food system from production to consumption, it emits around the third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we do have so many challenges, so many problems in relation to climate change and food security that are interacting. So agriculture, it is a problem, a big problem, and at the same time, it's a key part of the solution if we know how to use it. Because we can use it to reduce emissions, to become more efficient, to reduce the impacts on natural resources, particularly the loss of biodiversity. So we do have a problem, but there are also uh, solutions. So what we need is to raise ambition. We're not doing enough all countries from around the world, they're not doing enough to meet these, these objectives. We also need to invest more on adaptation. Why? Because we have no choice now but to adapt. We left it so late. We haven't reduced emissions to the level that we need to, that scientists from around the world are telling us that we have no choice but to adapt to the impact of climate change. And even adaptation, the whole climate finance all around the world, only 10% goes to adaptation. And the event I mentioned in California and Chile demonstrate the fact that we're not adapting because it's not the first time that we see hurricanes and forest fires and floods and droughts happening. So we need to wake up to this new reality and do something about it. And just last December, COP28, for those not familiar with COP, this is Conference of the Parties, leaders from all around the world and all sectors of the economy attend to see how we're doing to tackling climate change. And it has been encouraging, I would say, because the first time we've seen actually food on the agenda, and there was an Emirati declaration on food security and resilient food systems. And this is very much relevant to Africa, the recognition of food security. 
There was also investment in adaptation, in loss and damage. The first time we've seen money actually poured into loss and damage. So these are encouraging steps going forward. But what does it mean really to Africa? Where does Africa fit in? And since we're talking about the solutions, what are the solutions? So there are, there are many contrasts in Africa. Nine out of the 10 most vulnerable countries are in Africa. And Africa is also the hardest hit by hunger. There are 282 million people who go hungry every day in Africa. And it's almost 40% of the world undernourished people are in Africa. And there are many other statistics. You know, 60% of the Africans also live in poverty. This is the negative part. But Africa is blessed with the wealth of natural and human resources. It has 30% of the mineral, mineral reserves in the world. Africa is the youngest continent in the world and has a huge capacity on renewables as well. And in terms of impacts of climate change, Africa is, is, is very hardly hit because it's been affected a lot. And according to the government on, uh, on climate change, agricultural productivity decreased by 34 percent since 1961. And it doesn't make sense because 60 percent of the world's uncultivated land is in Africa. So the point I'm making here is that we need to start talking about Africa as not the, con uh, the, con the continent of problems and challenges, but actually the continent of solutions. And this is how I want to, to end my, my intervention. How do we get there in terms of, of solutions? I did a paper recently in Eliminum and talking about transforming Africa from the continent of challenges into the continent of solutions. And what I elaborated there is the principle of rise of Africa with pride. What does rise mean? R means for Africa to reaffirm its leadership in tackling these challenges of hunger and climate change. And here I want to bring in the example of, of Morocco, since we're talking about the perspective of Morocco and leadership that has been played by Morocco, particularly for the issue of agriculture and adaptation. And Morocco hosted COP22 and it set up the adaptation of, agricul of African agriculture, the AAA, and it has ministerial meeting every year to voice the needs of Africa in terms of adaptation and to attract financing for adaptation. It also launched an initiative to deal with the sustainable development of oases and to protect the cultural aspects and the existence of, of oases. And it has also been investing a lot in renewable energy, including hydrogen. I stand for invest investing in transforming the agri-food systems, investing in research, in innovation, in renewable energy. But more importantly, as I said earlier, that Africa being the youngest continent in the world, we have to invest in young people. We have to build the local capacity to be able to benefit from those natural resources in the continent. And Investment also, just to give the example of Morocco, Morocco has been leading investment in renewable energy. The biggest solar panel, the solar panel station is in where is that in Morocco, NOR. And also we will hear probably someone talking about the University of Mohammed VI Polytechnic, who's really a model in terms of building local capacity and encouraging South-South cooperation, bringing in African students to benefit from the knowledge and share their knowledge. The third point is S, scale up. Scale up investment in adaptation and resilience. Why this is important? Because Africa spends $50 billion a year importing food. And yet I mentioned the potential of Africa becoming not just self-efficient,
but feed in the global population as well. And my last point is E, is for Africa to embrace ownership or, and, and, and shaping its future by itself. And to share really the experience and the lessons between the countries and, and the South-South cooperation. So just to finish, I want to leave you with three main messages. To tackle these global challenges, and particularly climate change and food security, there are three takeaways that I would like you to note. So the first one is to start talking about Africa as a continent of solutions for the three points that I mentioned and the rise, for Africa to rise with pride to facing these challenges and providing solutions to the world. And the second point is the importance of political will and country leadership and the example of Morocco that we've been given. Now, I've been working in the, the UN for 11 years and been trying to support countries to build technical and political capacity. One thing that has always made a difference is the political will and the political commitment. Then things happen. And my third point is that if we want this transition and if we want to tackle these challenges as one global community, we live in one planet, then we need a just and inclusive transition. Transition has to be based on justice, that everyone benefits from the technology, from the advancement in knowledge, that it has to be inclusive and unjust. Because also the challenges we're dealing with, they are interconnected. The world doesn't happen in isolation. Climate, climate change by itself, we cannot just focus only on climate change because it's linked to food security, it's linked to health, it's linked to sustainable development. We have to think about things in a system approach and deal with synergies and pay particular attention to trade-offs, not try to resolve a problem in one side and create problem on the other side. So I hope I didn't go beyond 10 minutes and I hope this helped and these are my three points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Caroline Turanira, who is the country manager in Kenya for OCP Africa. Um, thank you very much. If uh, you could speak for 10 minutes, Caroline. Thank you. Your Excellencies, faculty, distinguished uh, guests, good evening. It is uh, my pleasure to join uh, this uh, distinguished uh, panel. When we talk about the African tapestry uh, of climate, crops, and culture in the context of uh, Morocco, I think of the natural uh, centrality of OCP in this uh, discourse. Morocco has access uh, uh, to 70% of the global reserves of phosphates, and OCP has the incredible responsibility as the custodian who is vertically integrated in the phosphate uh, value chain. I know many might be wondering what is phosphorus, but phosphorus is a critical uh, macronutrient that is required by plants for root development. Therefore, of course, uh, be a key anchor when it comes to agriculture and, of course, uh, production. OCP, therefore, has a steadfast commitment to catalyzing circular growth whilst addressing challenges of smallholder farmers now that we're in this agriculture space. Smallholder farmers in Africa face a lot of uh, challenges uh, which, of course, we're talking about uh, limited access to information, pests and diseases, uh, limited access to inputs, markets, weak financial resources, climate change, of course, et cetera, et cetera. So these challenges, when we are the custodian of phosphorus, we cannot be able to, uh, to play a big role in, uh, in the development of phosphorus when we are not addressing these challenges of smallholder farm, uh, farmers. On this, therefore, OCP leverages its expertise to customize plant nutrition solutions 
champion sustainability through water and energy efficiency, and innovation through research and development to contribute to uh, the sustainable economic development uh, in Africa. Next, the first slide, please. So uh, this is the industrial journey that encapsulates uh, OCP's experience in phosphorus and its uh, derivatives. OCP started off uh, mining and selling uh, phosphate rock and the organization over a century evolved to the integration of the entire phosphate value chain from mining to production and commercialization. Across this uh, journey, OCP has uh, leveraged on pa partnerships through, of course, as you can see, uh, joint ventures. Here we're talking about uh, Jacobs Engineering, IBM and others, of course, to deploy the best engineering designs and technologies to ensure that uh, uh, sustainable management of phosphorus at industrial, uh, industrial and research levels is maintained. On this also, what is also very critical to, to note is uh, in 2016, uh, as uh, OCP was actually still uh, in its uh, journey, uh, uh, OCP Africa, the subsidiary of OCP Group was created. And this was specifically to address the fertilizer needs of the, of the continent. There is no way we can address, or OCP could have addressed the, 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 the challenges of smallholder farmers when not dedicating subsidiaries that are physically in specific countries to address these needs. To also support this, uh, I believe you can see that also with, in 2017, uh, UM6P, uh, the Morocco University was also inaugurated to also uh, build capacity for research that would also support uh, OCP. So this is the journey of uh, OCP over a century, of course, uh, while incorporating innovation at uh, the heart of uh, OCP's strategy. Next. Okay, so this uh, map uh, shows the uh, industrial and commercial footprint of OCP Africa. As an African uh, country, our commitment to the African continent is naturally strong and ambitious, I must say. And of course, uh, OCP plays a critical role of responding to the challenges of African agriculture to, in order to provide sustainable solutions. OCP created uh, 12 subsidiaries that are physically, uh, are, are physically present uh, uh, in, uh, in the continent. And uh, these uh, subsidiaries uh, uh, actually also act as uh, logistics hubs for the entire continent. Of course, in, uh, in uh, countries where we are not physically located, uh, these subsidiaries are able to, uh, support in, uh, to support in the provision, of course, uh, of uh, supplying inputs to this uh, market and uh, of course, supporting the farmer-centric initiatives. So uh, within these uh, 12 uh, subsidiaries in OCP Africa, uh, OCP, has, uh, OCP Africa has a talent pool of uh, 300, over 300 employees of 17 nationalities. And it is important to note that uh, we, we do have many more indirect employees because these uh, subsidiaries, of course, uh, some have uh, blending units, of course, so, which uh, run uh, the are, of course, industrial. And of course, the ones that uh, uh, import, like the ones in Kenya, so of course, they support the commercial activities of uh, supplying imports. OCP Africa's uh, initiatives are entirely dedicated to strengthening the socioeconomic impact of uh, smallholder farmers especially uh, or of course uh, uh, supporting their integration within their ecosystem and that's why these subsidiaries were incorporated to ensure that 
uh, OCP is nearer to the smallholder farmers and therefore uh, uh, any initiatives that we are able, able to, uh, uh, to, to have uh, in those countries are able to, of course, to, to run uh, efficiently. Our ambition is to reach every African farmer with the right agronomic uh, solution. Next. So uh, we understand that the unlocking of uh, challenges for smallholder farmers is key for agricultural development in Africa. And our, our offer to smallholder farmers goes beyond, of course, the supply of fertilizers. Agriculture, as we understand as a OCP, is really a, a complex system that requires multi-sectorial solutions. Like, of course, uh, enhancing access to inputs, uh, building farmer knowledge, soil health management, farmer access to information. Uh, of course, uh, usage of digital platforms, uh, amongst many others. And that's why these uh, key strategic objectives for OCP Africa are very important. Now, uh, this, uh, uh, well, we, it's important I also bring out the point that uh, OCP works to contribute to the realization of the SDGs. Once we acknowledge, of course, the holistic complementarity of the SDG, SDGs, especially in, uh, in Africa, we do this through our farmer-centric initiatives to address the constraints of agriculture in Africa. So I can, uh, I'll just uh, highlight uh, very uh, briefly what those uh, key uh, uh, objectives are and uh, say uh, what we, we do in that. So on the first one, when we talk about uh, customized agronomic solutions beyond fertilizers, for sustainable intensification. Here we talk about, uh, of course, uh, providing agronomic solutions to smallholder farmers and ensuring that there is a linkage to players, to other players in the value chain. Now, this helps us to, of course, promote a holistic approach in ensuring that we're providing uh, solutions to a farmer from end to end. On the second objective, when we talk about integrated soil health management, innovative soil mapping, and related uh, initiatives, here we talk about uh, tailored nutrient recommendations. We cannot be able to address uh, uh, the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, food insecurity without uh, addressing the issue of our soil, of soil management. Therefore, tailored nutrient recommendations are very, very important. On the third one, we talk about uh, digital platforms. Uh, we do have a, a digital platform called Udongo that uh, has been rolled out across Africa. Now, this uh, uh, platform, of course, uh, uh, involves, of course, uh, 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 having an ecosystem of, uh, of smallholder farmers on it who interact with value chain players uh, just at the click of a button. Now, uh, we cannot talk about uh, sustainability in agriculture when we are not incorporating, of course, uh, new technologies. And therefore, that's why digital platforms are very critical to OCP. The other uh, objective that uh, is uh, critical to OCP, of course, is the bottom-up approach to enhancing farmer-centered intimacy. Here we are talking about, of course, uh, relying on the indigenous, indigenous knowledge that the smallholder farmers have in Africa and developing solutions with them so that developing solutions while well, we are involving them in the process. So um, another key objective that is very important also is the environment and climate smart agriculture. On this here, we're talking about developing new approaches. What are we talking about? We're talking about ecosystem recovery. We're talking about uh, enhancing uh, soil carbon levels. We're talking about uh, carbon sequestration. So all these, of course, are towards the climate smart agriculture. Now, uh, we can talk about all these objectives without talking about uh, uh, our soil integrated soil health management uh, projects that we run across Africa. So uh, we have uh, more than 20 uh, research and development uh, projects uh, that uh, are running in 16 countries uh, within Sub-Saharan Africa. And this one, I'd like to highlight that uh, we this 
uh, the reason we're running these programs is actually to build capacity of African researchers. We, we can only build the, the capacity within the con continent. So if we're able to build the capacity of the researchers, then they can be able to add value onto the solutions that are required for the, for the continent. Next. As a OCP, we appreciate the power of partnerships and the bulk of our efforts uh, within OCP are collaborative. Uh, we have a network of more than uh, 50 partners who are uh, generally from, uh, I'll talk about extension, technology, manufacturing, government agencies, universities and research institutions, and private players too, who make for a healthy ecosystem of partners. So we continuously build this uh, ecosystem with, uh, with uh, partners with varying expertise, and experience in order to achieve a thriving food system in Africa. We cannot do this without, of course, uh, partnership. So uh, I'll end my presentation here. So next, uh, I'll hand over to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. That's an incredibly sort of ambitious project and gives us quite a lot to talk about. Um, our next speaker, um, compliments our uh, the the talk you just heard very well. Um, our speaker is Dr. Donald Madukwe, who comes to us from Nigeria. He is the head of agronomy at uh, OCP Africa in Nigeria. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you very much, the moderator, and uh, thank you, the organizers of this um, forum. I think um, these are the type of discussions we should be having this time around because we really need to build a sustainable food system for Africa. I would not take much time but intensify on what my colleague um, Arimi said and I would like to take you through some of the pharmacentric projects OCP Africa has been doing in Africa to su support um, rural farmers build capacity of um, some local research institutions such that um, we can have a more sustainable um, process of producing and also urban hunger in Africa. So um, first of all, in 2016, when OCP Africa was created, what we did first was to understand the challenges within the smallholder uh, system, farming system, and we understood a lot of couple of problems limiting their efforts to produce more food. So um, we created some intervention programs which are centered around these farmers. First of the, was the school lab initiative. Um, understanding the importance of soil. Maintaining good health of the soil is key to producing more food. And so we started the School Lab Initiative, which as the name implies, is um, teaching and the laboratory activities in terms of soil testing in situ and recommendations that are tailored to farmers' field in uh, rural areas. So we're not focusing on commercial farms. We're focusing on the smallholder farmers with at least 0 0.2 hectares to one hectare. Um, these farmers oftentimes use the fertilizers wrongly. They know the name fertilizer. They actually don't know the, what MPK is in the fertilizer and why and when they are required. So the school labs tends to teach them good agronomic practices, teach them the essence of soil testing, and also recommending appropriate fertilizers. And um, the soil testing services was actually provided free of service so that everybody could participate and understand what the need for this is. Beyond this, we also find out some key challenges which uh, include education. Yes, they have been farming for a long time. Uh, they have some traditional knowledge. However, the linkage between the um, value chain, what happens at what time, are not clearly planned out. So they do their practices as traditional activities. Most farmers who have access to more land 
could not even make a living from it because it's just a traditional practice. So what OCP did was to create the Agri Booster Project, which created an ecosystem within the farmer, bringing together financiers, bringing together um, aggregators, um, off-takers of the produce, just creating the markets within them because most times they have the challenge of selling what they've produced and at the end they are discouraged of producing more. So we created markets within them they sell at a competitive market price. And we also brought around them uh, banks who can offer them loans to get um, inputs. When I say input, I mean quality inputs, okay? Hybrid seeds, quality fertilizers, uh, good agrochemicals. And then, and around this, we have trainers who train them how to use these quality inputs at the right time. We are to get them and what quantities to use for these inputs. That is what the Agri Booster was doing. We piloted this in Nigeria, and today we are running this across all, um, all the subsidiaries in Africa. So it is a program that has seen over uh, 580,000 farmers through, and um, they are embracing a lot more of this program. Go, moving from that, the most challenge of rural farmers in Africa is logistics. When I say logistics, I mean distribution of farm inputs was actually a very difficult thing to do. So some farmers are in core agrarian regions and they do a lot of um, agricultural activities, but they lack access to inputs, N not even the quality input. They lack access to any form of inputs in those areas. So what we did was to create a hub we call the farmer house around these farmers. The hub was to facilitate the aggregation of inputs early before the farming season so that they could have access to these inputs and have assurance of quality inputs within them and the communities. So creating this also, we found out that, yes, because we're piloting in Nigeria as wide as it is, there are communities that are further away from these hubs. And so we need to create the agri-promoters. The agri-promoters have knowledge of agriculture. They are young graduates and all they do is act as extension agents for um, the farmers, train them as well, as well as extend these um, farm inputs to them in communities maybe 20, 30 kilometers away from the hub. So these farmers have access to inputs and they have the agri-promoters. The agri-promoters are actually trained as entrepreneurs. So they make us a living from this. They work daily and they are happy doing what they're doing with the farmers and the farmers get to learn new uh, technologies every day. Beyond this, uh, my colleague mentioned about soil health, soil mapping activities. Because we actually want to understand the soils of Africa so that we can provide tailored solutions. So we'll set out to map over a um, hundred uh, formulas by 2030. So far we have 44 formulas, uh, specialty formulas. When I say specialty formulas, we mean fertilizer formulas that are inclusive of micronutrients and not just the macronutrients. And these are based on soil tests and other um, factors like um, yield indices. So um, we've also gone ahead to map over 50 million hectares across 10 countries in Africa, and we are continuing. We are hoping that we reach more countries by 2030 as well. Um, all this we do through collaboration because uh, at the heart of these achievements, we have collaborations, meaningful collaborations with institutions, um, local institutions, international institutions, donors, uh, and also ministries of agriculture in each of the countries we are present in. Um, she mentioned of Udongo. Udongo is also uh, uh, a web uh, a digital. It's both app uh, and a web-based application that enables the farmer to interact with extension agents, input uh, dealers, as well as uh, marketplace. So this on this app, the farmers can reach out 
they can find uh, resources on how to plant particular crops. They can find where they can get inputs, okay, beyond the farmer hubs. If they don't have any present, some can actually locate one and you can place order and you can get some uh, inputs delivered in good time. And uh, beyond this also, we are advancing the Udongo to have some presence like um, training of extension agents where they can take some short courses, okay? Just to revalidate their expertise to be able to serve the farmers very well. And we are looking at some offline um, trainings. Okay, um, beyond what we're doing closely, OCP is um, vigorously collaborating with institutions like um, Rotamsted Research here in the UK. We have the Greenfield um, University. If, if you saw the partners um, map showed earlier. So what we're doing is to deliver um, tailored you know, uh, technologies to African farmers. So in this partnership, we try to incorporates the local knowledge, not just to dump uh, foreign innovations to them. We we'll try to look at what the farmers are used to, what they can quickly adapt to. Otherwise, when you struggle to bring age-long um, research to them, they dump it if it is difficult to adapt in the first year. But when you try to improve on what they know already, what they do, like the uh, the director also has said, it is easy for them to adopt. And so this is the approach we use in OCP Africa to reach out to farmers. I extended 10 minutes. Um, I'll just show some pictures just to buttress uh, partnership, building capacities of um, local fertilizer manufacturers in different African uh, countries. We provide them trainings to understand the importance of incorporating micronutrients into fertilizer production, not just for, for um, soil health, but also for carbon hidden hunger in human beings. So all this we've done over the years to support a sustainable Food system for Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Menga Stapaili, um, who is the world uh, sort of regional director for the World Food Program in Southern Africa. Came to us from Johannesburg. Thank you very much, Dr. Menga Thank you very much, and uh, colleagues and ambassadors, diplomats, students, uh, professors. Um, good evening to you. Um, I would like to start by thanking SOAS and the Moroccan Embassy for uh, giving us this opportunity that we come here and talk to each other. Um, I want to start with a, a, a very brief personal journey uh, of my own. Um, you all remember 1984 in Ethiopia, we have that terrible famine. And I was a physics student in a university and we lost our cows, we lost our uh, resources. And since then I have, you know, at that time I said, what can I do to fight this famine, this drought, and then so on. So in 1989, I came here to the UK and I did my PhD in meteorology in Reading University. Then I went back, I joined WFP and I have been with WFP for 25 years. So climate, drought, famine, all are interlinked. Now, Colleagues have explained about smallholder farmers. Now, as a regional director, I, I covered 12 countries of the SADAC. And when I took the, post, the position, I said, what are the things that I should do uh, to help the countries? Um, as uh, Professor Habib said, you need to understand the local uh, challenges. So I traveled to the 12 countries and I met with more than 50 ministers and I met most of the presidents of those regions. And essentially to consult and listen to what they see is the key problem of food security. 
we agreed on four areas, and I will give you those four areas. Number one, Africa is dependent on smallholder farmers, rain-fed agriculture, and mostly women. That is, except a couple of countries, every country that you have in Africa, it is the women using traditional tools trying uh, to produce. Now, with the population growth, with urbanization, those women are not going to cope to produce enough food for the continent. Even if there is no climate change, even if there was no COVID, that means of production is not sustainable. It cannot feed the continent. Therefore, agriculture must be transformed. How? That is where colleagues are discussing. That's problem number one. Problem number two is unemployment. Every president you talk to, every minister you talk to, unemployment, especially for the youth. So on one hand, you cannot produce enough food. And on the other hand, you have huge unemployment. Now, the third element is interlinked. The young people are not interested to work in agriculture. And I cannot blame them in the, the traditional agriculture. And I was dis discussing with the president of Zimbabwe, and we were discussing this issue. And I told him, uh, Mr. President, imagine a young person today, on one hand, will be holding a mobile phone, and on the other hand, holding a hoe. It doesn't go together. So agriculture must be transformed so that it can attract the young people. The fourth element is evidence and data. Most governments are planning in different ways. There is no comprehensive data that each government, each ministry can use. So despite the technologies of this world today, with the satellite data that we have, you can look at every household or every house and so on. It's not even expensive, but it is not there. So this is something that needs to be interlinked. So these are the things that can transform the continent, transform agriculture, make it attractive to young people. And, and what I have heard from colleagues are the, the right steps, and we hope we, we continue. Now, in the title, it says the solutions and what is the role of Africa. I was attending the COP28, and I was interviewed by VOA, and they said, yeah, for what, what you are representing the Sadak region, and what are you taking from this COP28? And my answer was, no, we actually came to offer the world a solution, a solution that the world needs to take uh, seriously. And those, those two are, the Congo Basin is in Africa. The Congo Basin is one of the most efficient carbon sinks in the world. Now we are destroying it. The communities that are living there because they don't have food security assured, deforestation is happening. Now, instead of thinking of planting trees, we need to start protecting those. But those people must be paid or must be compensated so that they can keep the forests for us and for the world. So that is what Africa offers to the world, because if we don't, we are going to lose them. A second offer is in the entire world, where do you see lions, elephants, giraffes going around? Biodiversity. That is in Africa. Now, a number of you must have seen the Lion King. Well, the Lion King will not be there if we don't support those communities and help them to transform um, their livelihoods. So we need to think of alternate livelihoods. But Africa has, there is no other continent that has these opportunities, this biodiversity. But we are, and yet, these people are not producing. Now, it's good to hear about in enhancing a production uh, where smallholder farmers and, and so forth. A smallholder farmer today would produce about two metric tons per hectare. Now, what they do is in order to have more production, then they burn the land or expand their agriculture, which is a, a, a challenge itself. Now, if we increase the productivity, which you could easily have 10 uh, metric tons per hectare, 
then you don't need to plow that land. You don't need to destroy that forest. Now, last, I would like to conclude by, by talking about energy. If you go to a rural village, and I have traveled around in the continent, you go to a village and you see no energy and you see no water. If there is no energy and if there is no water, you have no hope of transformation. So this is where we come with green energy putting there. So in those villages, we don't even talk about energy transition. We talk about in COP, we talk uh, just uh, energy transition. Well, there, there is no energy. So it is transition from no energy to green energy. And Morocco is doing a great work on renewable uh, green energy. And you are working with, with, with youth. Now, these are things that we could, we could put. As WFP, we have an, an example we call is rapid rural transformation, and we can share with you. Uh, we have four villages in Madagascar, in the worst affected uh, villages. We just took a solar panel and we dug water. We have water, we have digital school. Uh, and from that, entrepreneurship starts. And those villages, they will never be hungry again. They would never be hungry again. Those rural women, rural young people, they do work. They want to change, but they are not getting the opportunities. So I, I stop here, uh, but I would be happy to um, continue the discussion, especially with young students that are around here. And I would be happy to share with you um, our addresses so that we can continue this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's go straight on to our last speaker, who is uh, our very own Dr. Annabel de Vries from SOAS, who is a Senior Lecturer in sustainable, Develop sustainable Development here in our own Development Studies Department. Thanks very much, Annabel. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here at this really wonderful event, which seems to bring together the essence of life, really. It's um, the environment, food and culture, specifically music, which we'll hear later. And I hope to be able to kind of synthesize some of the words that and uh, really interesting um, speakers that we've had this evening, because really all we're talking about is food security and food systems. And this idea of conceptualizing food security within a food systems framework has been acknowledged at very high levels recently, particularly the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, which is just one example which brought together stakeholders with the aim of delivering progress on all the 17 SDGs. And it was done through a food systems approach, which is seen to be interconnecting food systems to global challenges such as hunger, climate change, poverty, and inequality. And this term food systems sort of invites us to think about the broader set of valued outcomes such as nutrition, health, livelihoods, and planetary health, and to think about the broad factors which influence these outcomes and where there might be synergies and where there might be trade-offs. Key to understanding the complexity of food security is that food security is not just about having enough food to eat. It's this combination of being able to afford nutritious food consistently and having the functioning supporting systems such as water, as we've heard, but also good sanitation and good health systems, because these are the things that allow people to eat and utilize the food so that they're not sick and lose the nutrients that, they're, that have been so hardly fought to, to achieve. Whilst the majority of the population of Morocco, which is where we're focusing on today, is lucky enough not to experience high levels of food insecurity. Key problems such as obesity in adults is rising as it is across the whole of the continent. Currently just over 26% of the adult population are obese and over 50% of adults are overweight. So we have a thing that's turning on its head a little bit here. We have got this idea of a nutrition transition, which brings together new challenges. And it's gonna carry on like this as Africa urbanizes, becomes wealthier, because as that happens, people will be able to access more food, but it's the type of food that we need to be careful that people are actually eating. And this can cause non-communicable diseases like diabetes, and hypertension and heart disease. And whilst I believe Morocco has made incredible strides in reducing stunting and micronutrient deficiency, 
all three forms of malnutrition continue to exist. As we've heard this evening, Morocco has been identified as having great potential, not only producing sufficient food for its population, and, but also driving food security throughout the whole of the continent and particularly through its phosphate resources. However, it's important to remember that whilst developing these capacities in one area, we can understand and ensure that um, particularly uh, something like phosphate mining, which is water and energy, quite water and energy in intensive, the use of phosphate fertilizers can also leach into water bodies and damage ecosystems, further impacting food security. So this is a clear example of why we need to think more broadly about how we intervene. So one of the key things about a food system is that it's not the product of its parts, it's the interaction of its parts. And it's really important that we ensure that one part, actions in one part of the system have beneficial outcomes in, in the other for people and for planet. And one of the key factors here is this relationship between those parts. And I think hopefully, uh, although um, you've all spoken very, very clearly about so many different parts, it's so hard to connect those parts. And when you're studying, you know, we are so used to being in institutions which kind of um, focus on specialities. We focus on our own subject. It can be really difficult to understand those relationships. And understanding those relationships is really key because in seeking to understand the whole system, we need to understand different perspectives. And in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to consider the boundaries that we are, the boundaries of our thinking. These are all connected. Um, and they're connected to value judgments because the values we hold direct those, sorry, direct the drawing of boundaries around the knowledge that we believe is relevant, what's included and what's excluded in our analysis of the system. So understanding these interrelationships, the perspectives and the boundaries within the system is a preoccupation of systems thinkers, I'm going to say that. In the food system, the activities that people do and what they get from the food system is intricate, sorry, intricately linked to systems of relations. And this is the relationship that people have with food, what they grow. And we all have a relationship with food. Think about our culture, where we're from, our family. It's, it's how we see ourselves and how we see the food that we eat that, caught, that kind of is related to our identity. But food systems are often determined by this system, wider systems of relations that determine how people grow food and what they choose to eat and how they eat it. And of course, who gets to eat what and do what and in what way. In my own research um, many years ago in Mexico into the relationship between milpa um, cultivation and the milpero farmers, I found it wasn't just about growing food, it's the cultivation and the maintenance of that relationship between farmers, their land, nature, their history and their status. And I think this is really important as you were talking about this connection with the farmers and understanding local knowledge, because it's not our knowledge. We don't understand how people perceive their own cultural agricultural systems. So these social and cultural institutions do play an, an integral role in defining the food system. And it's also quite evident when we look at how gender relations determine women's access to land and inputs, as well as the benefits that women can derive, whether as producers or as consumers. And whilst there is quite a lot of variation across Africa in terms of female labor, um, the majority averages around, the average is around 40%. So women significantly contribute to Africa's agriculture and rural enterprises. But they also do so, in doing so, they fuel local and global economies and they play a key role in um, food security at the household level, both preparing, growing food, preparing food um, and caring for their family's health. But quite often this prevailing patriarchal systems which lim limit women's access to inputs and land such as technology and finance, as we've heard here, can really have a big impact on the food security of, the, of an area and a region. And so without establishing equitable relations, women and children will continue to be most affected by the shocks and stresses that occur in the food system. And this could be in, as a result of climate change or, or global food price hikes. 
Therefore, I think it's really important that we need to make an effort to understand each other's perspectives. In order to do this, we need to identify the actors in the system. We need to work out how they relate to each other, what elements of the system affects them and their ability to act and derive benefit from the food system. And finally, we need to understand and quantify the impact of those relations on each other and those outside the system. Essentially, we need to kind of map the system. One excellent example of systems thinking is work being done by researchers by CGIAR. And they've done incredible work in mapping the interrelationships between climate hazard agriculture and gender inequality. And they've created a map of hotspots where they look at national and subnational levels measuring projected climate risk, such as drought and extreme weather events, women's participation in agriculture, such as the share of women's labor, and exposure. And what we mean by exposure is their exposure to risk. So analyzing social institutions, such as restricted civil liberties, discriminatory family code, prevalence of gender-based violence, and by doing this, it's possible to get a better picture of the intersecting factors that affect food security. This type of understanding of the system interrelationships, boundaries and perspectives is vital to ensure that climate smart approaches are accompanied by institutional change. Another way of strengthening this approach is to become better systems thinkers. And we definitely need training to do this. Currently, our education and research institutions, national and multilateral governance systems often work within the scope of their expertise. And this is really valuable. We really need expertise. But when we're working in silos, we can't understand how those interrelationships work. So a program called Interdisciplinary Food Systems Teaching and Learning, IFSTAL, has been trying to change this. I'm part of this program as uh, SOAS is a, is a partner. And what we do is we work across universities, government departments and food industry actors. The program provides training in systems thinking and a space for people to work on systems problems together. The program is quite a unique experience. And so far we've had 200 participants attending in Ghana, Indonesia, um, Uganda, Vanuatu, Fiji, and what this does is it brings together ministries, sector workers, food retailers, small enterprises with students. And what you have there is you have a multi-sectorial, multi-interdisciplinary. Multi In addition to that, we have young professionals speaking and interacting with people at the top of their game, CEOs, um, new, um, new entrepreneurs, we have this um, sort of synthesis of knowledge and experience. And we also run a year long program in the UK, which brings together master students from SOAS, Oxford, Warwick and the Royal Veterinary College, School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And so far we've had over 2000 students come through, the, through this program. We also deal with food systems problems and that is the crux of the business that we're in. And what we do is we get students to do field visits. We do field visits with um, NGOs and charities and the government. And we get those people to set the students problems. We get them to tell our students what they need to work on. And here you've got this connection between being a student and the real world, which is really vital if we're gonna solve some of the really complex problems that we see in the food system. Collectively, we map the system, bringing together these different perspectives. This opportunity to interact and problem solve with individuals from different disciplines and sectors is key. We'll have doctoral students and academics from environmental sciences, from crop sciences, anthropology, economics, politics, working with NGOs and food sector professionals. This sharing of perspectives and transgressing of boundaries requires some effort. It's really difficult because we don't define things in the same way. But that's the key. We need to understand how these different organizations and people define the problem. What it does do is it facilitates a holistic understanding of the food system, which hopefully has the potential to bring benefits to those seeking to intervene, to achieve all these, the, uh, these uh, solutions to transform our food system to a sustainable and just one. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We've had an incredibly stimulating set of papers. Um, we have about 20 or 25 minutes for discussion. Um, I will take perhaps a collection of questions, but before I do so, and while people gather their thoughts, perhaps I can just highlight one or two things that some of our speakers have said. Um, so to a greater or lesser extent, all of the talks reminded me of a pair of articles that um, The Economist ran, the journal, the, Econ the magazine, The Economist ran in 2000. And they ran a set of articles side by side. The one was called Africa, the Hopeful Continent, and the other one was called Africa, the Hopeless Continent. Um, and the, it started with the first article was the Hopeless Continent, it started with the Hopeless Continent. And so central to that article, the one on the Hopeless article, on the Hopeless Continent, central to that article was uh, issues of food security. Uh, it very much emphasized uh, the continent's history of food insecurity and hunger. Uh, the article on the hopeful continent emphasized uh, democratization and each of these, uh, each of each of our pres presenters have spoken about democratization to some uh, a great extent. Um, and and um, in that I include the sort of issues of gender equality. And we've heard a number, uh, almost each of our, each of, each of our speakers spoke about the fact that, um, that women are primary agricultural producers um, and that issues of gender equality clearly have to be central to issues of food security. Um, almost all of our speakers have mentioned smallholder agriculture and spoken about the importance of smallholder agriculture. If I can give a little sort of history lesson from my own part of the world, Southern Africa. Um, uh, well, two, two, I think one thing for the African continent as a whole, we can certainly, the, the main point to make about smallholder production is how resilient it is. Um, smallholder agriculture has survived uh, against the odds, against the odds um, of agribusiness um, and commercial agriculture. Um, and I think that's something that's worth saying and worth noting. In Southern Africa, smallholder agriculture was certainly during the colonial period, 19th century, uh, first part of the, most of the 20th century, smallholder agriculture was absolutely decimated. African agriculture was decimated. Um, black, black, Black peasant production effectively decimated. Um, that's the case in uh, certainly the case in South Africa, but also the case in uh, in Zimbabwe, and it's also true for parts of East Africa. Certainly the case in Kenya. Um, and what secured the success of uh, big agriculture, big business, commercial agriculture? I mean, in these settler colonies that I've mentioned, of course, we're speaking about white agriculture. What secured the success of those industries was the intervention of the state, kind of massive state intervention. Uh, the big tobacco farmers of Zimbabwe, uh, the big maize farmers of South Africa have all benefited massively from state intervention. In instances where um, states were less supportive of agriculture, smallholder of settler agriculture, smallholder agriculture survived. The cotton farmers of Malawi, for example, completely destroyed uh, settler agriculture, um, small smallholder agriculture in Malawi during the colonial period. Um, so that is something that I think is worth thinking about. Um, exactly, you know, precisely the role of the state. How is the state harnessed? To we've heard about the sort of technical challenges of production, phosphates, and so forth. Um, but I don't think any of that um, can really um, sort of. Uh, realized their potential without a discussion of the state and what the state brings to smallholder, smallholder agriculture and agriculture in general. Those are just a few of my kind of random thoughts. Um, so I'll open the floor to um, questions and I'll, perhaps I'll take two or three um, and allow our speakers to address them in common. Yes, please, if you don't mind, so just introducing yourself. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, the name is Ali Bahajoub. And I would like to ask a question of Dr. Zituni, if I may. Uh, you mentioned that 31% uh, uh, of the food production is actually decreasing in Africa since uh, 1960, if I remember rightly. But it, that, it, that's not actually attributed just to climate change. It's attributed to several other factors. And I also remember, just, just as an example, the cocoa prices, for instance, are not actually fixed in Africa. They are fixed somewhere else, in London and Chicago. 
so uh, that's just one question. And the other, if I may, uh, Dr. Donald, you mentioned about the uh, the farmers not being able to distribute their produce. Uh, isn't the government, the Nigerian government, helping out, creating, for instance, cooperatives, so they could actually uh, uh, put their products together and then they will be able to distribute them through a governmental uh, agency. And also, is OCP uh, expanding in Africa apart from the, the 12 subsidiaries that were mentioned today? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll take another one, one or two questions. Please. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um... My name is El Kabir Lamrani. Um, I had a question. So before, so I have a question for uh, Dr. Haile. Haile, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, so before you spoke, I had this issue in my head, which is uh, we need to make agriculture more sustainable, which might come at a cost, a financial cost. But when you spoke, you introduced another issue, which is unemployment, and. You know, I think of these countries where the, they have a lot of people doing hand labor and picking things by their hands. And so there's a double need for these things because we need, first of all, a sustainable agriculture. But then on the second hand, we need a more adapted agriculture for a larger population. So my question is, how do you convince a head of state or a government to not only pay more, but also suffer in the beginning a dip in employment because you're going to scale up by bringing more machines and stuff. So yeah, my question is basically, how do you make them pay more and have less employed people? We'll take uh, one last question, which is over there. Please. Uh, okay, um, very thought provoking. Um, my name is Jonathan Tudor, I'm a climate technology investor. And agriculture, precision agriculture is one of our big themes. And I was just wondering what the region would have to do to leapfrog North America and Europe with the use of natural biologics, microbial coatings for seeds, for example, which displace, I know, some of the phosphates, but also then displace the emissions associated with fertilized production, but encourage greater soil health. And I just wondered what you collectively could do to adopt those faster than the rest of the world. I'll, I'll allow our speakers to respond to those questions. Perhaps I'll um, start with the first question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question um, on the decline of um, food productivity in, in Africa. So I've given that example since 1961, 34% uh, decrease. Um, and you're right. I think one of the key messages to take from everything you've heard so far is that food systems are complex and complicated. And that decrease is true in reality. It's not only due to the impact of climate change. There are other factors linked to that, uh, including you know, access to technology, access to finance. Um, and I think based on that, I was referring to that experience from 1961, and now we've seen the trend of the impact of, of climate change, biodiversity loss on food product productivity, um, not just in Africa, but around the world. Last year, even in Europe, we've seen so many crops affected by drought. Uh, in early spring, olives, for instance, you know, olive trees in, in Spain have been affected at that stage. And then later on in the summer, we've seen another heat wave in Europe that affected that. And as a result, the harvest was affected and the prices of olive oil have gone up as well. So you're right. And this is the key message from here is the interconnectivity of these factors. There are many factors interplaying of the agri-food system that are complex and complicated and related to so many factors, environmental, social, and also economic. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your question um, about what the government is doing to aid distribution or aggregation of produce. Yes, the government is actually working in various countries. However, the efforts of the government alone is not enough. The private sector needs to play a key role to support um, 
what the government is doing. Basically, the government creates um, the environments for other key players to come and support agriculture. For efficiency, there is really need for companies like OCP Africa to provide support, especially in the aggregation of produce, in the sense that there are a lot of challenges um, resulting to loss of food after harvest. Most of the losses are post-harvest losses, and uh, time is a critical factor. If you wait for government, probably we don't have as much food as we have because the government system doesn't really work as fast as the private sector does. So there is need to collaborate, support what the government is doing to reach a faster end. That is number one. Number two, um, is OCP expanding beyond the 12 countries? The answer is yes. OCP is actually trying to reach us to other, other countries. For example, we have um, Tanzania trying to extend support to DRC, to Burundi. We have Kenya supporting Uganda. We have Nigeria supporting uh, Niger, supporting um, Togo and other countries within the surrounding. And there are uh, concerted efforts to make sure that there are there we have physical presence in some of these countries, especially in Central Africa. So the activities that are ongoing. Um, for the uh, third question about um, smart agriculture, right? What are you talking about? So um, at the heart of what we do as OCP Africa is innovation, is research and development. Um, companies like yours, we seek collaboration to make sure that we bring um, value to what we add. Yes, we're talking about phosphorus, we're talking about soil, we're talking about um, efficiency of uh, nutrients in soil so as to feed the crops. So there is need also beyond um, adding fertilizers, we need to fortify the um, organic matter of the soil so as to create efficiency for the use of these nutrients. Yes, there are a lot of activities going, not to say it's enough, we can stop collaborating. We cannot um, uh, stop sharing knowledge and expertise. And so, yes, we invite you. If you have proposals, let us discuss them and see what we can do together. Thank you. Okay, well, well thank you. And uh, for that question, uh, let me take the opp this opportunity actually to, to say, uh, to highlight um, uh, Professor Habib talked about COVID and, and how the, the vaccines were not reaching people. Well, there is something that the region has learned from COVID and Ukraine and so on, is that you cannot depend on external supply. So every country that you talk now in the Sadak region, they want to produce their own food. And I give you an example. Botswana and Angola are very rich in terms of Funds. And every food that they have in their supermarket was coming from South Africa. But when COVID came, South Africa blocked and there was no food going to Angola or no food going to Botswana. Now that triggered those governments to do whatever it takes to actually produce. That's one area where governments are working together to find a solution. The second is Young people are changing governments. So if they are unemployed and they are idle, they are changing those governments. Therefore, governments want to stay in power. And therefore, they must create a mechanism to employ and, 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 and so on. So because of the COVID, because of even Ukraine and now the Red Sea, um, governments are wanting to produce. At the same time, they want to stay in power. Therefore, they must help the young people to be employed. So it's a good time for all of us to work together and use this uh, to, to move forward. Uh, but what you said, it, it, indeed, governments are ready to do what it takes because of their, their survival is dependent also on what they do. Thank you. Okay. Um, just, I, I've probably just got a couple of comments um, that probably interconnect um, this idea of employment and also of kind of smart technologies. Um, I think 
um, understanding how, first of all, with employment, uh, there are there is work being done in Africa, particularly from governments that run youth agricultural programs. Um, and I've had uh, words with and conversations with people in Uganda who um, are entrepreneurs and are encouraging uh, the, the, the agricultural um, sector to employ youth and to make it exciting. And I think a lot of the time this is where smart agriculture and we're talking about yeah you're talking about biofurification um but also this uh, this connection between technology and agriculture on the one hand we we can't forget the farmers that work su su subsistence subsistently and indeed that that has been persistent no matter how hard it is people want to work on their own farms actually it's really important. And I think that goes back to some of the, you know, a lot of work being done on this, this relationship between farmers and the land is, is a really intricate relationship. But I think that, that this idea of um, employment and um, attracting young people into the, the farming business as young ent ent entrepreneurs, I think there's a lot of scope there. And certainly um, I've seen it in Uganda with young farmers wanting to become, what, sorry, young students wanting to become farmers and be entrepreneurs. They see it as an entrepreneurial thing rather than something that they go off into the rural areas and, and do in isolation. So perhaps there's some synergies there. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to have to apologize to um, people who have questions. Um, I've seen a few hands and I'm really, really sorry, but I can't take that, but we are running quite far over time. So I'm going to draw the session to a close. Um, because again, greatly for the... Our second panel offers a unique conversation between Dr. Zainab Bedawi and Dr. Ahmed Ali on building bridges of understanding Morocco's unique interfaith and multi multicultural dialogue. Their discussion promises to enlighten us on the power of dialogue and understanding and fostering peace and unity. So please welcome me, join me in welcoming the doctors. It's very good to see you. Uh... So many of you attending this event that's been organized jointly by us here at SOAS and the um, Embassy of uh, Morocco. So I am in a very privileged position of having one of um, the Islamic world's great thinkers sharing this platform with me. Dr. Ahmed Abadi um, is somebody I had heard of for some time, and I was really delighted to at last um, meet him in person. He has um, a real PhD, unlike me. <laughs> Mine is just honorary. You see, I'm very honest. Um, in Islamic studies, and um, he has been um, engaged in postdoctoral studies at the Sorbonne University. He's had a stint um, as an adjunct professor at the University of Chicago, and he's also um, taught at Sciences Po in Paris as an adjunct professor there also. And he's director general of the um, Mohammedan League of Religious Scholars, and he's a professor at the Mohammed VI University in um, Morocco. Do you describe yourself as a passionate uh, peace seeker, and so much of his work has been dedicated just to that. And also, you like playing chess, I understand. You like playing it, but are you any good at it? That's what I want to know. And if you are, then I'd like some tips. And, um, and uh, you know, Dr. Ahmed Abadi in this session is going to bring his own huge wealth of knowledge and scholarship to our conversation. And he comes from the city of Fez in, um, in Morocco. And of course, that has been a real center of enlightenment and um, scholarship and research since the eight, 800s, I think, when a university was established there. So um, it must be something in the water of Fez that it has managed to maintain the strong reputation and tradition. 
for so many centuries. But um, Dr. Abadi, of course, is also a representative, in a sense, of the great country of uh, Morocco, which, of course, has a Mediterranean as well as an Atlantic coast, a people of just under 40 million who, of course, have a, a triple heritage, really, Arab, African, uh, Amazigh, actually four, and you would say also some European influences because of that Mediterranean coast. And that whole, you know, melange, it's a wonderful mix that has really really made Morocco the great country it is today. And as somebody who has really enjoyed traveling around the country and examining so many of its historical sites from the Volubilis, which is built, you know, by, by the um, Moroccans when the um, Romans were, were influencing that part of uh, the continent, right down to all the wonderful, you know, Kutubia mosques and, and, and all the rest of it. it it's really uh, quite overwhelming. It's a wonderful country to see. Every city um, really just, um, you know, seeps with great history. And um, Dr. Abadi, you are somebody who... Um, takes your citizenship of the world very, very seriously, as well as the fact that you are, of course, um, so practiced in, in matters of faith. And again, Morocco has a great tradition to draw on because you've had for many, many centuries a Jewish community, of course, a predominantly Muslim country. And um, you have brought that together in the work that you do by trying to promote, you know, a, a dialogue of culture between people who are not necessarily um, engaged in conflict as a result of their religion, but where religion may be an you know, exacerbating factor or at least a contributory factor. But what I'd like to do with you, and I'd also like to invite uh, comments from the floor, um, is to just say, Adam Habib said at the outset that we all face global challenges and they have to be solved um, by the involvement of the global south and, and Morocco's very well placed, as I said, to do that. So just uh, outline for us, perhaps not dwelling on the environment so much, because we've had a very substantial panel on, on matters of climate change, um, but to, to look beyond that and to just perhaps sum up for us briefly what you see as the, you know, some of the great global challenges. So just start with one and then tell us how you feel Morocco perhaps can uh, help solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zainab. And I would like first to express how honored I feel tonight to be among you to tackle those issues uh, that I qualify as being burning issues of our time. Because at the end of the day, we are on a little tiny pale blue lot suspended in a sunbeam. This is what Earth is. And we are so ephemeral, but we tend to forget it. We are a very noisy species, and we uh, are very egoistic, egocentric even, and we miss our lives because this is the capital, capital life, those breaths. And if we do not learn how to transcend and how to look at ourselves and to our planets in a global way, we would then keep on missing it for the rest of the days, weeks, months, years, decades, and centuries that are passing on and would be just dwelling in, in, in our places whereas our ancestors have spent so much, so much sweat, so much blood, so much tears to bring us where, they, where, where we are today. Um, we are suffering from many problems, Zainab and dear esteemed audience, but the way we are looking at those problems, the drives that are driving us to tackle those problems, because some of us, have grown up to be just like vultures. I see a problem, then it's a, an opportunity for me to make money. It's an opportunity, opportunity for me to grow my business. I do not go beyond this deeper to my chakra and draw from love for life and for the rest of my brothers and sisters and even my brothers and sisters to come, to not call them out of pittery, my daughters and sons, brothers and sisters. And 
to see how waste, which, which is one of the most burning issues, waste, while wasting too much opportunities, or wasting too much time. And just as an example, each year around the planet, we discuss over 80 million theses. But are those theses symphonized, or are they just, you know, loads of ideas and paper that are wasted? What problem could stand in front of 80 million person years of cogitations if it was engineered, if it was algorithmized, and if it was channeled towards our big problems. Waste of water, waste of assets, waste of opportunities, name it. Because the drives are not well enough. I was advised by one of my dearest elders once, Ahmed, never be friend with someone whose mind is made. Always be friend with someone whose mind is female. I said, why is that so? I said, because those whose minds are male are always looking to fertilize other minds. They cannot get pregnant with a new idea. And they cannot give birth to a new idea. And this is our case at the end. We are tending to have male brains and minds. We cannot get pregnant with new ideas, nor give birth to new ideas. We like that, I think. Yes. <laughs> we like that very much, that women are the originators of, of all. Of life. Of life, yeah. Creativity. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. Who, so just yeah. let, let's, let's, let's think, let's think, of the possibilities, if those theses were symphonized, how many problems we can sort and we can solve if the drives are the right ones. So you're saying that there are 18 million... 80. P what, eight zero, zero yes. million PhD yes. theses P being per, written yes. globally. Yes. And that they're, that they're duplicating material, they're not synchronized, they're not working coordinated not. to solve the big ideas. Even in challenge. the same universities, they are not. And because we don't have a sense of what are the priorities. Look, let, let me just enumerate some of the most burning problems of our era. One, environment. Who can debate this? Who can not recognize that this is a burning problem? To the Titans' war. Imagine a, a nuclear headed ro rocket hitting the bottom of the Pacific and magma coming out, game over. That's so, when you end. say the Titans' war, you mean Russia, the US, China? The, the, the big these, guys. The big, guy, yeah. big guys. Yes. Three ways. Four. Well, we are... Before you go on to all of them, because you yeah. know, we're running to catch up here. Hang on, you know we've gone through the Titans' War. Let's stop with the ti uh, the Titans' War for a moment. So, your what is the point you want to make about the Titans' War? The U.S., Russia, China, these superpowers. You, do you feel that a lot of the conflicts in the world are either that they're engaged in them, like we're seeing in Ukraine with with Russia, or they are? present somehow using proxies all over the world. And if that is the case, which a lot of people think it is, what is it that can be done then? What can we do? Because you can't just give a counsel of despair, can you? You must try and give us some ideas as to how people like you or countries like Morocco are positioned perhaps to try to engage in some kind of activity. I'd Let's like to this. quote here a Mud Luther King who once said, Let's live as brothers and sisters. Otherwise, we, all of us are going to die as fools. And this is the case. When we do not have this holistic image of our reality, when our thoughts are so refractioned and we do not live within our minds and psyches and emotions in the real world, we happen even to not know what is the real world. We're 
living in imaginariums, as Thomas Hobbes once said, and those imaginariums were trying to impose them upon the rest of us. And it, my way or the highway, we need to highlight the fact that now it is almost the apocalypse if we don't go back to reason, if we do not manage a way to talk to each other, to sit and to live as a unique family. Uh, 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 and there is in South Africa this Ubuntu uh, matter, which is a very beautiful matter. How many of you know what is Ubuntu? Yeah. Could you, Ruth, please explain what is Ubuntu? Yes, please. No, I exist because of you or something like that? Yeah. I, am I am because we are. I am I because am. we are. And th this is so beautiful. We need to go back deeper than just material interests to see what the future would like if we manage the way to have female minds and brains and psyches and manage a way to dream, to have marvelous ideas like Peter Pan that would allow us to fly once again in Neverland. So, okay, so that's the Titans War and that's the way you feel that to try and promote a culture of peace. So you talked about waste. Yes. And uh, we touched uh, the importance of the environment, the Titans War. So w give us another challenge then. Addiction. Addiction. Well, I've grown up what? to be a very addicted species. Like addiction to what? Social media? Everything. Drugs, everything. To oh, drugs, my goodness. To voyeurism, to digital matters, to food, to entertainment, to sugar, yes. <laughs> So we are an addicted species because we've lost the capacity to say the magic word, which is no, just two letters, no, no. How to relearn again how to say no. And here comes the role of religions, because religions are not just operating the discernment between good and bad, but also elevating the will to say yes to good things and no, no to bad things. And uh, if we work it and sort it together, we would reach a level where this capacity to say no is not sold anymore. Because if you go to a disintoxication center, you need to pay tons of money just to be able again to say no to alcohol or to drugs or to food or to anything. So we need to have it for free again and to re-teach ourselves how to say. And this lays on the fact to re-consider the fact that we are not unidimensional. Humans, we, are not unidimensional. We are having a Welt en Chang, cosmological dimension, existential, which is not addressed as it should. Who am I? Where am I? What is life? What is death? We're afraid even to operate thoughts about what is death, what is success, what is failure. We don't have enough conceptualizations uh, of those dimensions. Two, we don't know the emotions that we host within us. Bernie Brown, the author of Dare to Lead and Atlas of the Heart, has uh, um, spotted one of four emotions. And we need to be friends with those emotions. Otherwise, they would get to us. Three, intellectually... What are those four emotions? Do you want to enumerate? 104. Uh, oh, no, no. We haven't got time for that. Sorry. I, oh, I number one. <laughs> I one. There was sort of broad categories. And, and okay. the Buddhists have, have discerned 108 agonies of the soul. Just the agonies of the soul... 108, but we are so ignorant about who we are. And this noise within is what pushes us to use substances and drugs and, and become addicts because we are fleeing from ourselves all the time. We cannot manage to live within and we just escape towards all those matters. We've enumerated before. So you're putting a lot of emphasis on the individual here, individual responsibility 
and you said that we must be taught to say no. How do we get to say no to the bad things and yes to the good then? Just if you allow me, Dr. Zainab, to uh, finish the nine dimensions of us. So one, existential, two, emotional, three, intellectual. We do not teach our children how to observe, how to compare, how to triangulate, how to anticipate, how to decide, how we do not teach those capacities in a clear and accessible way through gamification and so on and so forth. For society, it has become a Leviathan. We don't know this Leviathan and we're so scared to live within it because we feel persecuted. We are so afraid from society because we do not know what it is and nobody is telling us what it is. If I want to go to social sciences, it is too, too intricate, too complicated and nobody is bringing me accessibility, clarity and beauty to get acquainted with this being, which is society I'm living in. And five, we have the international dimension. We don't know what it is. Universe, we don't know it. Psychomotricity, we don't know it. Memory, it is a fragmented memory. And it is an ill memory with narratives that are not true, with a lot of validities and vindictiveness. And last but not least, the nucleus of all those electrodes it is so beautiful to imagine it this way, when you have the dream in the center and all the other electrodes rotating around it, this capacity to be able to dream again and dare to dream, this we have lost. We need to elevate it once again. And once we start looking at ourselves as multidimensional, we would deal with ourselves in a different way. And then our educational systems would follow, they would change, because they would realize how um, scattering we were when looking at humans as just bodies and intellects, and pushing in oblivion all the other dimensions. Okay, so uh, you've told us what we ought to do, but do you have any tips on how we might do this grand uh, project and um, you're saying that we as parents are failing to instill the right values in our children or and there are societal pressures and societies to blame as well wouldn't like to look at it as failure no the majority of us have never even had the time to think about it and once we realize we're a very daring species you just go for it and this was the case. I dared once to go to the Minister of Education in my country, in Morocco, and spoke to him about those nine dimensions. Then he asked me, Ahmed, if we're not doing this in our educational system, what are we doing then? And we started the program, and it is not running. Moreover, uh, Norway discovered the program, and they came in and they started financing it. Japan realized that there was such a program and they came in and they gave a very handsome uh, fund to 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 encourage it what is it sort of civic values it's, course and it's about guides you know when you come to a, a youngster and ask them do you want to be popular they'll say yes of course do you know how no do you want me to accompany you to learn how i'm not going to teach you just a company. Yes. So, and we've developed programs how to have a TV, how to run it, how to have a radio, how to run it, how to develop cartoons, and how to run, how to gamify, and how to run this in sustainability, how to become a good influencer. And they just they're buying it. And the lists we trust we we trusted the project, and we went to test the robustness of it in one of the most prestigious universities in, in, in the country, Al-Akhawain University in Ifran, and the, 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 our, our students were competing, and we could not 
uh, take all of them. And now they are educating themselves because it's a system of peers education. When it is uh, uh, appealing, when it is gamified, when it is bringing you popularity, and then when you have uh, an enough rate of likes, you will start making some money as well. And you'd be eligible to good universities such as selves. And, and then you're just taking it. Sounds like a, a great initiative and, and it clearly works. So it's a very practical uh, application there of what uh, you were saying. But in, in your um, mentioning of um, addiction and, you know, you've talked about various addictions. So let's just hone in on one, which is um, social media and AI, artificial intelligence. Everybody's talking a great deal about that now and the need to ensure that it doesn't, you know, run amok. It's a bit like fire, isn't it? It's very useful if it's controlled, but you've got to make sure that there are controls and it just doesn't run wild. So what are your reflections on the need for it's it's a global challenge after all it is it is and it's also an opportunity we need to get rid of this rotten fear within us because this rotten fear within us is what has caused the global trust disorder we don't trust each other anymore and this is why we invest yearly basis 17 trillion dollars on weaponry we use in Time of war, no more than 13 point some uh, dust uh, percent. Hopefully, thank God. But uh, uh, if you take this amount of 17 trillion, you divide it among us, 8 billion and some, it would give you $2,000 a year each. Imagine a family in any deprived part of the world receiving a family of 10, receiving $20,000 a year. How can we close such a window of uh, hemorrhage? To rebuilding trust. But trust cannot be given. It, need to be, it needs to be snatched. So you have many venues in which you can invest and you would realize that this, this is a matter of functionality. We are not in a combia structure, but it's something functional that would have returns on investments. If you invest in those regards, you would have returns on, on investments. So it's not a failure. We just need to see. And this is what is called in our religions, and especially in Christianity, amazing grace. Once I was blind, now I can see. Once you see the light and you start being able again to see, then you go for it. Moreover, you would appropriate it. It would be yours. It is not something that would be dictated to you. And as for artificial intelligence, yes, it is a very big player that has come in the scene, an unexpected one. And the, the time of corona, of COVID, was a good time for the initiators to develop those tools and see and verify their robustness. Now they are within. It is bringing with it addiction to it. Mm -hmm. It is bringing with it some leading against it and not doing what we shall do to sharpen our inner capacities because then we'll be relaying too much on artificial intelligence. So we need to manage this newcomer to render is our friend and not fall in uh, all what has been instigated in terms of Terminator and the machines taking over and all this, 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 uh, those narratives. We need to be uh, optimistic uh, in uh, the uh, hopeful world and not hopeless world and take it, integrate it in our education system, manage the plagia risks and so on and use it for the best of the rest of us. Interesting. You, you said there in your answer, you talked about a global trust disorder. But just to narrow it down, um, you know, we heard in the earlier panel about the efforts that Morocco is doing through um, its agricultural initiatives to uh, to combat food insecurity um, in Africa. And obviously, historically, Morocco has always been at the crossroads of uh, what is called sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, you know, very much at the crossroads of trans-Saharan trade. So, 
I wonder if you feel that that lack of trust also extends within the continent of Africa. In other words, should Africa trust Africa more, do you think? Not before gathering the conditions, because then we'd be asking people to be naive and it, this could be very dangerous. We need to have our conditions. And if those conditions are fulfilled, then we need to dare to trust. Um, Morocco, uh, just as like England, and uh, Dr. Zainab knows Africa better than uh, the majority of us, because she wrote some very interesting books about Africa. She was presiding also the Royal Society of African Studies. And so she, you are the one who tell us what it is about. But uh, This is about you. <laughs> thank you. But Morocco uh, was uh, always in a place that allowed uh, its people to have this transcendence because the Atlantic Ocean used to be called uh, then uh, the Sea of Darknesses. And the, in the old Imaginarium, there was nothing beyond. It was the end of the world. Bahr uh, Dolomat. Nothing beyond. So we were there looking all those tsunami waves erupting from the epicenter then of the world, which is the Middle East. And they would take time to arrive to us or we would go through pilgrimage to see what it is about. And then we would digest them through the enzymes that we've developed through millenniums. England has the same characteristic and maybe, maybe another asset, which is being small. Morocco is not a big country. So uh, if we use this asset to speak to everybody else, as England, uh, and especially after Brexit, if we use those assets, we have no ambitions beyond our size. And people who are ambitions beyond their size suffer and generate suffering for, for the rest of the world. So there is also this um, must of ambitions management. Since we have the asset to be small, we can contribute in spreading this awareness all over the place. And then we might aspire to have maybe some platforms that would allow us a cogitation that disconnects itself from benefits and from just matter and matter and gain. So just one more question from me before I open it up to the floor. I mustn't, after all, hog this all. And uh, just to say, you've said several times you've mentioned fear and how we mustn't fear this, we mustn't fear that, and so on. So I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, because we're seeing, particularly within the context of migration and immigration and so on, you know, fear of the other, and how that's fueling um, various political movements, um, particularly in Europe and so on. So uh, just perhaps expand on that a bit, Dr. Ahmed. So allow me, Dr. Zainab, to be a little bit more operational in that regard. If our nations are entrapped in the political time, then we would not have the opportunity to process in a systemic way. And you were emphasizing, Dr. Annabelle, on being systemic and addressing intricate issues. And if it is just a five year, four years time term, I need to start my campaign before those four years or five years are, are, are over. We need to develop in our nations and continents um, structures that would have the responsibility, not just the opportunity, the responsibility to think in a transcendental time that goes beyond the political time. The Royal Societies here in England have allowed such a cogitation and reflection. And this is what has led Great Britain to what it has become, to what it is right now. In Morocco, we are doing uh, about the same. We are trying to generate institutions that would have the charge and responsibility to think beyond the political time. And it is not a matter of democracy. 
because democracy asks for such institutions. In the United States of America, as in the rest of the world, they are trying to solve the problematic through launching think tanks. But what good is a think tank if uh, you don't have beside it do tanks to verify that there are no collateral damages, if there is no cognitive philanthropy uh, for, for those regards. So we, if we want to transcend this fear, need to bring light, not just in our minds, but also in our hearts and emotions and psyches. And this is what has been proven by someone who's been doing 13 years of footage with hyenas, with sharks in the ocean, and with other animals, ferocious animals. But he's been working on building trust again and being good to those creatures. They started trusting him, even to snakes. So the majority of the extermination, because we ended up exterminating over 99.99% of our brothers and sisters of all the species on this little tiny pale dot. And you have uh, Sir David Ottenberg, who has spotted since 1937, the year of his birth, up right now, how we have damaged our Mother Earth. So when you suck away the venom of fear, the rotten fear, everything would start changing. But we need um, stakeholders and champions that would follow up with this matter. Moreover, it is beautiful. Is, isn't that so? Is, isn't this beautiful? Yeah. What was it about hyenas, sharks, and the rest of snakes? What? Living with them. Oh, no, 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 no. And I've... building trust again. I, you, had, you had me totally agreeing with you <laughs> until we got to that bit. But anyway, <laughs> no, I'm joking. All right, let's see. Um, what, what questions? A lot of um, very, very in fascinating thoughts there. I'll take two or three. So, okay, let's take this young lady here. I like you because you're wearing a big psoas sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Nkemdili Mukunjo, and my question is to Dr. Ahmad Dabadi. And um, I, my question is, do you feel as though the interconnectedness of the mind and the soul is exactly what our society needs when people say that the authentic part of the soul is something not needed? And also, how long do you think that the transcendent force will take to reach different parts of the world, especially the young people who are not ready to hear that? Let's take those, because there are two questions in one. Okay. Thank you. I'll let you off. Do you want to take the first one first? Yeah. <laughs> Youngsters are more thirsty to those things and matters than we think. They're very open to such a discourse. They're takers. They are craving it. And if you look at the success of so many series of cartoons that were highlighting those dimensions, uh, it is yoked to the fact that there is this hunger and thirst among our youngsters. But we need to present it in an empirical way. Um, we need to allow them to put their hands in the bakery paste and make them bake their pastry for themselves and, and, and consume it and see what it is. It is not just um, as if I was trying to make someone being satisfied food-wise by talking about food. You know what a pizza is, especially if it is in Palermo. <laughs> you know, it tastes such an Maybe it would increase hunger. It is the same with spirituality. If we just talk about it and how beautiful it is without sitting with those people and trying to keep silent for one hour and then tell them how you could process your thoughts and your impulsions during this hour and assist them 
to serve again, to regain the capacity to serve within themselves, talking to them about their inner dimensions, the emotions they have within, and how to be friend with fear. Because fear could happen to be one of the best friends ever. It's She's very wise. Fear is very wise. Even uh, she has purple hair, but, you know, she's beautiful and very wise. When you talk this way about spirituality to youngsters, they would adhere, they would, but they need to practice. You know, and this is something that we've, we do not do enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, microphone, yeah, to the chap next to the young lady and just put a microphone here. Yeah. So, and then do you want to give the microphone to him so we can just do them in rapid succession? Any more questions? Yeah. Great. Yep, go ahead. Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Nduka. I am a student and co-founder of Motherland, along my fellow co-founders and students at SOAS. So before I give my question, I will set some context. Motherland was founded to rechannel the African talent within the student diaspora, the African diaspora in the UK, towards solving and building solutions for the African markets, towards powering Africa's growth. And just last year, actually, over here in the Brunei Gallery, we launched the very first Inter-University Entrepreneurship Summit for founders solving African problems and funded different entrepreneurs from different universities, from Cambridge, LSE, to local colleges. And my question actually is for you, Dr. Zainab, no, 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 no. This as, is his gig. And Dr. Ahmed, actually. Okay, for both yeah, Dr. Ahmed. Because Dr. Ahmed mentioned something about the uh, about Africa and also talked about your book with um, an African history for Africa. And I think it's extremely important, just going off of the spirit of that, um, to shape and control narratives because I think that has a powerful play towards influence and culture at the collective level. And so for both of you, what would you say is the role of institutions in this shaping of culture? And what is the role of institutions, particularly in bringing attention to initiatives, stories that can shape culture in a positive way? Because so many times, especially being a minority in the UK, where we don't necessarily control the main agenda of media, maybe the BBC or what have you not, there are many competing uh, agendas. It could be difficult for people who have good ideas, good initiatives to, because on one end, build the initiative is useful, but on the other end, bring the attention that is necessary to transform culture. So what would you say uh, institutions, what role do institutions have uh, to play in that? That is my question. Okay, thank you. And then the microphone to there, and then there's the lady behind you. But go ahead, Dr. Abadi, on the role of institutions in promoting a more inclusive dialogue. Alan uh, Tree uh, compulses me to ask you to start first. Well, I mean, I think it depends, you know, which institutions you're talking about, educational institutions. Obviously, you've got to ensure that your curriculums do have, you know, perspectives. I, I'm a great believer in giving people the, the courtesy and according them the respect of telling their own history, which is, as you said, the premise of my book, An African History of Africa. Um, I think that it's important to get the perspectives of the local people themselves, because, you know, if you're dealing with poverty in 
I don't know, you know, in somewhere in Asia, it's going to be a different approach from how you approach it in, you know, a part of Africa. And even within the continent, there are differences. So I think you've got to have local perspectives and institutions must ensure that that is reflected amongst their, you know, teaching staff, their um, the research facilities and so on. And then again, you know, you've got to have a diverse culture within um institutions like you know media and so on and um governments really have to facilitate that so uh, it's just i think it, to ensure that those people who are involved and who are driving the institutions have that diversity of perspectives is what i would say this is very inspiring stories are wonderful shapers of culture and novels, as well as songs, as well as movies, could shape whole identity if well dealt with. And when we um, ask the institutions about what are the capacities they are building and how functional are those capacities and how do they ordain them to be like a necklace, those capacities to free know-hows and free efficiency in reaching out the dreams, collective dreams that we have agreed upon. Then you would see that the majority of the capacities that have been built in our institutions are to respond to the markets. And not in virtuosity, the market is just the boss. And it is asking you to shape, to produce human beings that would be able to do this and that, this way and that way, period. I am ordaining you to give me such profiles, such human beings, period. We need to flip over this request and to look at our context and what are our real serious threatening problems and what are the capacities that would help us to solve those problems and then ask our institutions to build up those capacities because they have so many craftsmen and women that are able to craft those capacities to have them respond to the problems of the context. And this is a whole new perspective. Mm -hmm. And stories also could play a role in that. Thank you. Good. So we've got one question here and then the lady at the uh, in the beige shawl. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Namdi. And I have a question actually for Dr. Abadi. Uh, my question is, uh, can you list the 104 different feelings? That we... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I think we've all enjoyed um, this session that's been organized by SOA. So thank you, first of all, to the organizers. Thank and thank you to Ida, who actually invited um, us a, a few weeks ago when we randomly saw her at the reception upstairs. Um, but no, my, my question is for you, Dr. Abadi. Please. Um, last week, I was speaking with a friend of mine, and he said that, if I can try and quote him, I think the main thing that's holding Africa's economic development is that we're holding on to religion. And I told him, I think we need to be careful of trying to always make the other argument. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. We are what we are. And I come from Nigeria. It's about 55% Muslim, just under 40% Christian. We are what we are. There are people who believe in this faith. I'm, I'm a Christian. I have many Muslim friends. What can we do with what we have? How can we not just get along, but work understanding each other to advance our, our economic potential? Although I didn't agree with the premise of my friend's statement, it is true in a sense that, if you will, it multi-faith, um, multicultural dialogue and interfaith dialogue is linked inextricably with um, economic advancement in some way in Africa, at, at least in terms of as you said earlier, do we trust each other or do we not trust each other? How can we 
despite our differences in faith and culture, trust each other and work to build the economy of Africa, which is something I very much want to contribute to. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final question, the lady behind you there in the shawl. Thank you. And we'll do those two together as your closing thoughts, but briefly, if you would, I think. Okay. Hello, I'm Kautar. Um, I have a question for Dr. Ahmed. Um, so going back to the interfaith point that you made, um, that you, that with it, you we are able to say the magic word, no, um, have discipline. And also um, you later mentioned that um, in time of darkness, it can bring light and hope, um, etc. How can the leaders in Morocco and institutes in Morocco um, facilitate to the Moroccan society, either being in Morocco or abroad, um, help basically decolonize the Moroccan mind um, and bring us back to who we are, truly are as Moroccans uh, before colonization? Because, you know, they left, they colonized a the country, left, but they still, till this day, colonize a mind. A lot of Moroccans live a lifestyle of the West. And how, can, what, what is the role or what should the institutions do to bring us back to who we are, um, you know? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think Morocco became a protectorate in 1912, didn't it? And then it's independence in 1956. So in that time, clearly, a lot of colonization of the mind, as the young lady put it, took place. So maybe do the first one first about how to promote interfaith dialogue. Was it you, the, your friend thinking that religion has helped back development in Africa? That was your question. And then the one about recolonizing the Moroccan mind. Yeah, the worst thing about colonization is that the colonizers have a male mind, <laughs> unfortunately. But, you know, what happened in the whole world, the colonized people could snatch some know-hows and capacities, nevertheless. And this is something that uh, could be um, uh, put in the uh, positive dimension of what occurred, uh, not uh, being positive about colonialism, but some positive matters have occurred. Uh, now we're sitting in London, we're speaking English, communicating, uh, regardless of our nationalities and uh, countries of origin. This is uh, to install and instill uh, French in uh, Occidental Africa or English in the rest of the world. It has taken a great effort. So those are some of the positive dimensions as well. For religion, you know, my late professor, Michel Mela, in Sorbonne, wrote a book that he has entitled Pour une science des religions, for a religion's science, to deal with religions uh, as being a science. And in Sorbonne, uh, there is a very old tradition of comparatism uh, within religions, and especially the late Mercia Iliad, who wrote opuses in, in, in those regards. You know what is the bottom line in religions? What are religions here for when you try to explore the majority of them? This is to bring us happiness, to make us happy. Here, and for those who believe in the hereafter, in the hereafter as well. Happiness is the finality of finalities of religions. But what happened is that the codifiers and legalistic people came and took over. And religions have been rendered to be codes of do's, not do's, licit, illicit, demoniac, divine, and name it. A binary system that is quite comfortable, and everybody would just go and fit within it, forgetting about the other dimensions. Statistically wise, nothing more than 4 or 5% of religiosity is about codes and do's and not do's, licits and, and the rest is about love, is about transcendence, is about doing together, living together, but we've forgotten this. To prove this, we have elaborated an index of 
within the realm of Islam, Islamicity. What is an Islamic state? Because, you know, there are many Islamist groups that have erupted and we're talking about Islamization of the state, the Sharia implementation and so on. So we asked ourselves among scholars from all over the Muslim world, even from Iran, from Iraq, from Bahrain, from Kuwait, from Egypt, from Morocco, Malaysia, Pakistan, and the rest of the Muslim world, we gathered in 2008 in Kuala Lumpur, and we asked ourselves those questions. And we found that there are six finalities to each religion, to every religion, and Islam is not an exception in this regard. One, preservation of life. Two, preservation of morality. Three, preservation of continuity of the species. Four, preservation of dignity. Five, preservation of reason. And six, preservation of property. And all the do's and not do's would just serve those finalities. The forbidden of thefts, for instance, is to preserve property. The forbidden of adultery in religions is to preserve the continuity and so on. And we have tried to deconstruct each one of those finalities into sub-finalities. And we ended up with 300 finalities that allowed us to develop criteria, indicators, and indices to measure this Islamicity. And talking about the preservation of life, it is not just the preaching dimension. Preservation of life is to have good medical schools, good nurses, good hospitals, good uh, medicine factories, and all the capacities and trainings that would go with, with this. And uh, 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 Habib was, uh, was talking about uh, the vaccine and how people did not have access to it, accessibility to medication, food, water, and if you apply those indicators and indices, you know, at the end of the day, when we've applied for the first time this index to measure Islamicity, but worldwide, you know what is the country who is the most Islamic in the world in relation to those indicators and indices and criteria? Or oh, Sweden. Oh, yes. Because it's about contestantiality. It is not about just the appearances to have mosques and to have, you know, or churches or synagogues. Or It's about the quant essence. It's about being good to yourself and to the rest of the people. It's about beauty. And when we forgot this and we fall in the trap of codification, then what stays in terms of religiosity is just imposition and despotism and compulsion, whereas there shouldn't be any compulsion in religiosity. When we free our religiosities from all those shackles of binary systems and go a little deeper into the quant essential dimensions, then religions would serve the purpose you've, you have stated. Well, Dr. Ahmed Abadi, you truly have woven a very intricate tapestry of uh, thoughts, provoking ideas for us. We've been through environment, waste, the war of the titans, global distrust, there, there AI, is... fear. Is there another question? Yes, I, I think, though, we've... I've... Yeah, just, oh. just a word. Okay, just a we'll word. a word, because uh, we're out of time. You know... Yes, okay, if you make it brief, who was it? No, 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 it was... Um, oh yes. yes, the lady about Colin asked a very deep I question as well. Uh, yes, okay. I just teased uh, the audience talking about that the colonialisms have uh, a male brains, and <laughs> but uh, the core of the question: How could we mm, uh, be inspiring to the rest of us when I respect my own claims? When I live up to the morality I subscribe in, when I give away, when I show generosity, not just generosity of material donation, but generosity of the smile, generosity of the word, generosity of the presence, generosity of being interested, 
because interested is interesting. And when I succeed doing so towards the rest of the world, the rest of us, then the mayonnaise would take. <laughs> Very inspiring conversation. I'm sure you agree with Dr. Ahmed Abadi. You've, um, I think, given us a bit of a spiritual reboot and we're going to emerge with a, a stronger attachment to ideas of sisterhood and uh, brotherhood. And uh, I'm sure that all the women in this hall will agree with me that we like the idea that the female mind is far superior to the male one. We like that one. Dr. Abad, it's been a great pleasure to have you with us. Please give me a round of applause. We are almost coming to the end. Uh, before I introduce our final incredible speaker, just know this is a Moroccan event. So there's food outside and Moroccan tea waiting in a, in a minute and, and music as well, which I'll talk about um, in a bit. But finally, His Excellency, Mr. Hakim Hajwi, Ambassador of His Majesty, the King of Morocco to the United Kingdom. Um, now I don't know. We'll we'll deliver his remarks. His Excellency, I think it's good. Bring up your insights. Well, good evening, uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. I have the very difficult task to summarize the unsummarizable, but I hope you enjoyed the conference as much as much as I did, and I personally wished the conversation to go on and on and go through the 104 emotions. <laughs> but maybe for, uh, for the break. But just let me start by saying how fantastic it is to speak about Morocco here in SOAS. And we have been working on this event with Professor Adam Habib and his colleagues for almost a year now. So we're delighted. And we're particularly delighted because we speak about Africa, which is a priority for Morocco. We're very proud of our African roots and we feel very much grounded in our continent. A continent of solutions, as we like to see it, and as it was uh, recalled many times. And I would like to share with you a few thoughts, starting with this photo. Um, so this is a monumental uh, installation by the Moroccan artist, Amin El Guteibi, that he called Illuminate the Light. And he was showcased in Somerset House during the latest London edition of 154, which is one of the biggest African art fairs uh, in the world, uh, founded by another Moroccan, Turiel Glewi. And Emin came up with this artwork after a long and immersive journey throughout Africa. And his sculptures, as you can see, represents the seeds of a pomegranate, Rahman, uh, as we say in Arabic, to depict the diversity and yet wholly interconnected of the richness of the African continent. And the light uh, projected in the next uh, uh, picture, well, the light projected is a metaphor for him to foster positive stories about Africa and to counter the frequent stereotypes of the dark continent. And I think the, the work of Amin, Illuminate the Lights, uh, captures very well the essence uh, of this conference. So we need to reimagine the narrative about Africa. We spoke about the narrative. And the point was made many times. Africa is not a continent of darkness. It is a continent of light. And the, the word light was used many times as well. It is a continent of solutions with huge untapped potential to tackle some of the most pressing global challenges. Of course, without dismissing the burning issues, and Dr. Abadi has eloquently address some of them in his conversation, but always with an opti optimistic global perspective and a, a genuine message of hope. But to succeed in that, uh, we need a holistic and systemic approach, was made in the first panel. I think that was highlighted very clearly as well in, in the second conversation. The first panel showcased how Africa can not only feed itself, but be a breadbasket for the world while playing a tremendous role in mitigating climate change and creating many exciting opportunities for African youth. 
let's bring the agriculture sexy back again. But it requires believing in Africa's opportunities and it requires also investments, clear investments and win-win partnerships. And this is the spirit of Morocco's unwavering commitment to the sustainable development of Africa. And it is driven by the enlightened vision of His Majesty King Mohammed VI for the continent, which places South-South cooperation and human development at the core. The last point I would like to make is to emphasize diversity and unity. And it was brilliantly covered as well in the, the two panels and it's particularly relevant to today's discussion. Morocco's diversity is enriched by 13 centuries of history at the crossroads of many civilizations. We're proud to be Africans, Arabs, Berbers. We're proud of our cultural diversity, Sahrawi, Amazir, Sephardic, and we embrace all this diversity as a richness that we nurture and cherish vividly and that is enshrined in our constitution. It is an illustration of how diversity, when embraced, can become, can become our greatest asset. And Africa is a huge continent, as there are many geographies, crops and, crops and climates, there are thousands of civilizations. And steering clear of a cliche, if we come closer together and combine better our energies for a more stable and prosperous Africa, sky's the limit. And it is also through knowledge sharing, exchange and mutual understanding, and uh, Professor Adam Habib mentioned bridging, that we'll break the perceptions and create new solutions together. And this is exactly why our collaboration with platforms like SOAS is essential to embark the new generation of leaders. So I hope the conference has been insightful, spark your curiosity to delve deeper into Morocco's model and spur further research and interest in Africa. And we at the, the embassy look forward to many other initiatives uh, with SOAS. And we're very proud to have more and more Moroccan students uh, here. Yes. And alumni as well, I hope they're here. <laughs> so to conclude, and I would like uh, to thank, it's the Oscar moment, okay? Um, First of all, uh, President Dr. Zainab Hadawi for reigniting this relationship between Morocco and SOAS. And Zainab has done tremendous work on the history of Africa and she, she has been too humble about it. But her book, An African History of Africa, will be published on April 18th, free ad. And, and as we said, this, uh, we're delighted if there's a fabulous section about Morocco. Of course, the esteemed Dr. Abadi for being our guest of honor and for such an inspiring talk. All the speakers as well for their insights and for making it to London from all over Africa. And uh, our Kenyan friend could not come because she didn't get her visa on time. Right? Just uh, um, doc, thank you, Professor Adam Habib and the whole SWAS team for being so excited about Morocco and for hosting us so wonderfully tonight. And there are some Moroccan food afterwards. Um, and we look forward to, to building more bridges together with OCP and Africa and UM6P, our great sponsors as well uh, for tonight who are doing a truly remarkable work in Africa. Um, and last but not least, uh, the team of the embassy and uh, Adnan and Hajar in particular, who I'm sure will be so depressed at the end of the event, so much they will feel a, a, a huge void and no irony, of course. <laughs> uh, finally, and I will really stop here, um, today's conference aims to celebrate our African roots. So what a better way to immerse ourselves in the mesmerizing and mystic rhythms of the Gnawa music. With its deep African vibes and Sufi spirit, it's a symbol of the multicultural diversity that Morocco embodies. So please, Enjoy our artist, Berber Diffusion, uh, after the break. And thank you again for joining us, and let's celebrate. Thank you.